it then. Okay, we're rolling. Rat. Rat. Thousands. Millions of them. HPPodcraft.com. <laughs> On July 16, 1923, I moved into Exum Priory after the last workman had finished his labors. The restoration had been a stupendous task, for little had remained of the deserted pile but a shell-like ruin. Yet because it had been the seat of my ancestors, I let no expense deter me. The place had not been inhabited since the reign of James I, when a tragedy of intensely hideous though largely unexplained nature had struck down the master, five of his children, and several servants and driven forth under a cloud of suspicion and terror the third son, my lineal progenitor, and the only survivor of the abhorred line. With this sole heir denounced as a murderer, the estate had reverted to the crown, nor had the accused man made any attempt to exculpate himself or regain his property. Shaken by some horror greater than that of conscience of the law, and expressing only a frantic wish to exclude the ancient edifice from his sight and memory, Walter de la Poire, 11th Baron Exum, fled to Virginia, and there founded the family which, by the next century, had become known as Delapore. That is a lot of information in a first paragraph. Boy, it is. We got some history, we yeah. got some names, and uh, before we discuss those, let me give you some names. All right. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. Oh, I'm Chris Lackey. And today we have a guest, somebody whose name we've spoken so much, we've actually conjured him up. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Hyde. Yes, do not call up that which you cannot put down. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, thanks for being back on the show with us. Thanks so much for having me back on. I'm always happy to be here. And uh, that beautiful opening paragraph was read by Andrew Lehman, making his triumphant second season return. Oh, yeah, I know. This is the first time we've had him back. It's, yeah. It's a crime we haven't had him back sooner. And uh, that opening paragraph was, of course, from The Rats in the Walls. Which is this week's story. It is. And it's such a great title. I don't want to get past that. It is a great title. It is a good title. When I was a teenager, I read this one thing, and this is going to creep me out. It delivered. Absolutely. I've, this is one of the first Lovecraft stories I've read. I think the first, uh, this is maybe one of the ones that I read in that first sort of um, uh, explosion of Lovecraft reading when I found the old copy of Dunwich Horror and Others or whatever it was in the garage that was my dad's old copy. I don't know if it was the Armed Forces edition or if it was one from the 60s, but it was some terrible uh, yellow-backed uh, edition of the thing, and it had sort of a greatest hits compilation. <laughs> right. And I probably read Rats in the Walls, you know, in a white heat, having read, you know, three or four of the stories in a row. I've always had a, a rat a phobia. I mean, it's oh, yeah. one of my things that squicks me out. So like you say, you hit a story and it begins with the rats in the walls on the title. You're, this is not going to end well. No. You just know that <laughs> trouble is going to ensue. I got to say, we just read this in a white heat back to back with a lurking fear. Yeah. And because of that, I actually was having some mental difficulties because there's a lot of similarities between the stories. Me too, yeah. You have these ancient estates owned by a family with a strange history. You know, somebody in that mm -hmm. in that history breaks away from the family. In that story, he was murdered for it. And yeah. this one, he did the murdering. So this is familiar territory for Lovecraft, but... It's such a well-written story, I think it kind of rises above his canon. And, and, and not to um, uh, give it away, but the ending is very similar, too. Yes, yeah. The um, uh, breeding pits underneath the house and the rest yeah. of it. Yeah. Although, I mean, the thing about this story is, I mean, like you say, coming right after The Lurking Fear, it's, it's like two different people wrote the story. I mean, Rats in the Walls, Joshi says it's his first great story, and I think... You know, Joshi's maybe not wrong on this. I think Eric Zahn is one of his great stories. But Rats in the Walls is the first absolute hardcore masterpiece. It's the only story that was ever anthologized in his lifetime of his. Yeah. And, I mean, if, if he'd never written another word after Rats in the Walls, he would still be in horror anthologies because of Rats in the Walls, I think. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. That uh, anthology was called Switch on the Light, 1931. Yeah. Wow. So, we know that our protagonist is Delapore. He's an American. Yeah. And uh, he's restored Exum Priory, we've learned, uh, which is his family's seat. What do we know about this building? Well, Exum Priory had remained untenanted, though later allotted to the estates of the Norris family, and much studied because of its peculiarly composite architecture. An architecture involving Gothic towers resting on a Saxon or Romanesque substructure, whose foundation in turn was of a still earlier order or blend of orders. Roman and even Druidic or native Kimric. Architects and antiquarians loved to examine this strange relic of forgotten centuries, but the country folk hated it. They had hated it hundreds of years before when my ancestors lived there, and they hated it now with the moss and mold of abandonment on it. I had not been a day in Anchester before I knew I came of an accursed house, and this week workmen have blown up Exum Priory. 
and are busy obliterating the traces of its foundations. <laughs> Kaboom! Also uh, very similar to uh, Lurking Fear. But such a such a great way to open the story. I mean, certainly for this period in Lovecraft's uh, career, it's such a sort of straightforward journalistic sort of a way, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He begins Absolutely. with an actual date, and then at the end, and you know, we're two paragraphs in, and this week workmen have blown up Exum Priory. <laughs> it, like, wow! <laughs> I know. Something really bad happened in there. Those are so, I love those solutions of just blowing things up, too. That's such an American solution. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> What, what, you know, why have these people been dealing with these legends and these ghost Just stories? Blow them Just up. blow it up. Just blow them up. Uh, what, is, uh, what is native Kimrick? The, the Kimrick is, um, it, well, the Welsh are the Kimru. That's in their own language. Ah, gotcha. So the Kimrick are the, are the pre-Roman Britons, the people who lived in uh, the British Isles before the Romans invaded it. Oh, oh, there you go. I thought it was a type and, of cat. <laughs> <laughs> no. And, and when Lovecraft was writing, there was the belief that the Kimrick were the second wave of, of Celts, and that there was an older wave that were the Gales that would have been shoved into Ireland by the Kimrick oh, invasion. Oh, wow. And that's all prehistory stuff. Nobody really knows. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, uh, before we get to exactly why the Priory was blown up, we learn a little bit about our protagonist and his family. Our protagonist knows only that his forebears moved to America under some kind of cloud. Yeah. Uh, the family never boasted about their heritage other than to hand a sealed envelope yeah. uh, down from the father to each eldest son when the time came. Right. Unfortunately, during the Civil War, the American family home in Virginia it was burnt down, taking with it our protagonist's grandfather and the sealed envelope. Yeah, so his father, the, prota or the prota protagonist's father, and him have no idea what was in that envelope. Exactly. And the name of their estate in Virginia was Carfax. Great call out to Dracula. Exactly. Yes. Well, anyway, luckily for our protagonist, though, his father moved them up north, and he was raised a Yankee. Yeah. So, woo! <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank goodness he's a Yankee. Yes. It's too bad he didn't know about that envelope. He says, you know, he could have saved on some ceiling fans and uh, <laughs> aluminum siding with all right. the expense he put into the house. <laughs> um, but anyway, our, our guy's father dies without any envelope to Not pass until on. 1904. Right, in yeah. 1904, that's correct. And um, our protagonist has his own son, Alfred, who uh, grows up and enters the military, going off to England as an aviation officer mm -hmm. in the Great War. And that's where he meets Captain Edward Norris. That's right. And uh, Norris uh, is from Anchester, which is near uh, the Delapore's ancestral home. Well, in fact, the estate has been allotted to the Norris family. Yeah. So they actually now control those lands. And Edward Norris has a lot of tales right. about about his family. And, and so... Alfred is writing back to his father and telling him of all these wild stories. Yeah, and this stuff gets Delapore, our protagonist, so excited he just decides to buy and restore the family home from the Norris family. But things go bad. I bought Exum Priory in 1918, but was almost immediately distracted from my plans of restoration by the return of my son as a maimed invalid. During the two years that he lived, I thought of nothing but his care, having even placed my business under the direction of partners. In 1921, as I found myself bereaved and aimless, a retired manufacturer no longer young, I resolved to divert my remaining years with my new possession. So that, that I found that uncommonly sad. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the thing that's interesting about this, and that's really very unusual, I mean, there's only one or two characters in Lovecraft that you actually get this kind of internal uh, quality on. There's this guy, and there's Peasley in Shadow Over Time, Shadow Out of Time, rather where uh, there's a genuine human crisis going on in their life as well as, you know, horrible ghost monsters or whatever it happens to be. And when you read about this this poor guy and he's sort of, you know, he talks about how the, the his past was basically destroyed when he was seven and then his future dies in 1920 right. with his son, you, you really get a sense that this guy is really sort of cut off from any kind of, of human contact except for this guy in England who wrote him letters about his son's career. Yeah. You know, you, you don't get this with a lot of the other Lovecraft protagonists who basically exist only to go through files or read letters right, and right. don't really have any interior life of their own. You know, Thing on the Doorstep actually is, is another one that I actually felt kind of emotional connection to, uh, you know, the, the protagonist and his friend. Like, they had a real, yeah. a yeah. genuine friendship and cared about each other. But it is rare. Yeah, that's those are the three stories I can think of in all of Lovecraft. <laughs> and, and and I always thought that it's it's having a wounded or hurt protagonist really brings you into a horror story better. You know, yeah. In some of the best movies they're coming from some kind of conflict that maybe you only know a little bit about, right. so they're already in a really delicate place. I'm thinking of the Changeling. I'm thinking with, of the Changeling yeah, too. Yeah, George yeah. Scott. Yeah, um, where he loses his uh, his wife and his daughter in the first scene of the movie, and then 
moves to a haunted house. Yeah. <laughs> As so often happens. Exactly. Uh, so our protagonist then arrives in England, happy, of course, as Kent said, to hang out with Captain Norris. And uh, they begin restoring their ancient home, right. which is just a ruin. So they, they want to restore it so it begins to look like it had been three centuries before. And, uh, of course, much like the moon bog, he's got a higher outside. I was thinking that, too. I was thinking yeah. that, too. Yeah, yeah, Because the locals, they, they won't have anything to do with the house or with him. In fact, he says that they viewed the Priory as nothing less than a haunt for fiends and werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the Della Pora, this is one of the notes I had. Uh, supposedly, Poor uh, was Poe's name before they came over. Oh, right. Della the... Poer was. Yeah, yeah. Well, apparently, a woman who was uh, affianced to Poe, I, I think it's uh, the one right before he died, uh, Whitman, um, her middle name was Power, or one of her uh, lineal names was Power. And she wrote to him saying that they had a common ancestor named Della Pore. Ah, there you go. There we go. And. Uh, that showed up apparently in a biography of Poe, or rather, actually in a biography of Whitman, that Lovecraft had read. So he knew he knew that fact about Poe having had a Delapore ancestor. And obviously, since this story, like I've said, is is such a huge uh, Poe esque story, it's, right. it's it's essentially his his riff on House of Usher. Mm-hmm. That you can you can tell that he's really trying to introduce a, a Poe life feeling to it as well as, you know, make it very much his own story. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So as they work on this estate, Delapore studies the ruins and he sees that it stands on this pre-Druidic temple. Yep. Uh, where he sees evidence of Latin phrases that, you know, they, they tell him about the Magna Mater, pagan Earth Mother stuff. Right. And he knows from his historical research that there were some nameless rites going on down there when the Romans were in place. Right. And, and that the Christian church just absorbed those orgies and, and rituals. Well, there was a, yeah, there was they a, moved in. a monastic order moved in mm-hmm. and people would leave them alone because they were so creeped out by the place. <laughs> right. So who knows what they were doing in there? Well, he sees the first mention of his family in the his historical documents as being 1307. They're mentioned as uh, the Delapores, as cursed of God. Right. Around when the castle was erected on the on the side of this temple. Yep. And um, he says next to the things whispered about his family, you know, Gilles de Ray and, and the Marquis de Sade were, were pussies, basically. <laughs> 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 I, I know Marquis de Sade, but who's Gilles de Ray? Is he... Uh... I don't know that. Gilles de Ray is the historical bluebeard. Although he was, um, he didn't kill a bunch of wives. He killed a whole bunch of uh, his peasants and tenants. He, he had huge estates in Brittany, and um, he was a buddy of Joan of Arc's. Actually, they uh, fought together against the English oh. in the uh, in the Hundred Years' War. And after Joan was captured and turned over to the English by uh, the Burgundians, Gilles basically pulled out of the war, went back to Brittany, and uh, depending on who you who you read, either to recoup the vast expenses that he had uh, undertaken in the war, or just because he liked living large, he turned to black magic as an attempt to get um, uh, wealthy, <laughs> and in the course of the black magic research, discovered a, I suppose, hitherto unknown talent for sadism and, and murder, and uh, wound up killing, I, I, I think it was a churchman that he finally laid impious hands on and tortured to death in the cellar, God. and that... <laughs> And that let and that let him open to a church investigation, and they came in and they found, you know, again, in, in Lovecraft style, a whole grotto full of black magic and uh, human bones, and they dragged him off and uh, executed him. Wow! Wow! Yeah, pretty great. And <laughs> and compared to this family, those guys were pussy cats. Yeah, no. that's right. And, and, and he was nothing to the Della. Pores. Exactly. Yeah. And and uh, and of the Della Pores, the he says the the barons and their direct heirs were the worst in in these legends. And that there was a sort of an inner cult in the family that, you know, if somebody had healthier inclinations in that family, they would quickly kind of disappear <laughs> and be replaced by some other, you know, family, family member. member. Yeah, huh? Although people could also sort of marry into the cult. You know, right. one, one woman, Lady Margaret Trevor, was said to be a bane of children, and they even made an old ballad about her. I think that's such a nice detail. Yeah. yeah. Well, so our protagonist ends up moving in, finally, on July 16th, uh, 1923 into a household that uh, consists of seven servants and nine cats. Seems about right. <laughs> yeah. He also finds out that um, Walter uh, Delapore killed his father, three uh, three brothers, and two sisters. Mm-hmm. And then he took off to Virginia. Right, and everybody his just Yeah, his ancestor. Right. Who, and everybody let it happen. Yeah, exactly. Everybody was cool with it. They weren't too upset no. that he was, yeah. They're like, good riddance. And, uh, you know, all of these legends and superstitions about his past, Delapore, he kind of finds these things repellent. 
Um, I mean, I'd be a little uncomfortable if all these people were talking this much shit about my family, right. too. You know? Yeah, exactly. But they also remind him of more recent uh, betrayals. Randolph Delapore, his cousin, went among the Negroes and became a voodoo priest. Yeah. <laughs> a close relative of his. <laughs> that, that's current, you know? I found that really right. a surprising little detail. That, that is. And there are some vaguer legends as well that, that don't bother him as much, but maybe should. I was much less disturbed by the vaguer tales of wails and howlings in the barren windswept valley beneath the limestone cliff, of the graveyard stenches after the spring rains, of the floundering, squealing white thing on which Sir John Clave's horse had trod one night in the lonely field, and of the servant who had gone mad at what he saw in the priory in the full light of day. Mm. The, the, the squealing white thing. And I like that he's much less disturbed by that. Yeah, that doesn't bother him. <laughs> like, so well, a squealing white thing, that could be anything, yeah, really. Yeah, anything. But, uh, you know, Lovecraft's really setting us up. Mm. He's really building and building and building. A few of the tales were exceedingly picturesque and made me wish I had learnt more of comparative mythology in my youth. There was, for instance, the belief that a legion of bat-winged devils kept witches' Sabbath each night at the Priory. A legion whose sustenance might explain the disproportionate abundance of coarse vegetables harvested in the vast gardens. And, most vivid of all, there was the dramatic epic of the rats. The scampering army of obscene vermin which had burst forth from the castle three months after the tragedy that doomed it to desertion. The lean, filthy, ravenous army which had swept all before it and devoured fowl, cats, dogs, hogs, sheep, and even two hapless human beings before its fury was spent. Around that unforgettable rodent army, a whole separate cycle of myths revolves, for it scattered among the village homes and brought curses and horrors in its train. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> so now the scene is definitely now all it's set. set. Yes, okay. we've got the yeah. rebuilt house, the legends of the ancestors, Legends of the Rats. Yep. And now our friend moves in. He moves in, and uh, the first incident occurs on July 22nd, and his cat started acting strangely. Now, uh, mm -hmm. this cat was named after Lovecraft's cat when he was young. Right, Nigerman. Uh, did I, did no, I, did I read um, that wrong? Yeah. This was Lovecraft's... The cat is named Nigerman. Right. And uh, this was the name of a cat that Lovecraft had when he was young. When he was a boy. Yeah. Which kind of gives you an idea of the household he grew up in. Right. Well, at, at the time, it wasn't as unusual a name as it, you know, as, even, you know, as it would have been when Lovecraft was writing. Mm -hmm. And it was less unusual 20 years before that. And one assumes 20 years before that when his father, whoever would have been, right. uh, thinking up cat names. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, it's still not, um, you know, most of the abolitionists uh, in the time, you know, in the uh, mid 1800s or I'm sorry, uh, early 1800s. Uh, they, they said colored, they wouldn't even, they didn't even say mm -hmm. that either. So, I mean, it's been not a great word for a long time. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I don't think any of us like saying the word, so, you know, we're, we'll dodge it, but, uh, yeah. um, but you know, I mean, it's something I always think of Huck Finn. I mean, yeah. it's, it's something when you read, um, uh, something from the time, you just have to take it with a grain of salt try and get past it <laughs> right exactly. and, and i and i think that although there's there's plenty of um uh there, i mean there, there's plenty of evidence for lovecraft's uh um retrograde racial opinions both in this story and elsewhere that is not re i mean the name of the cat is not really the the, the real um uh, smoking gun in the indictment i think oh yeah not oh, at all. No, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> i mean no. when, when you get to horror and red hook you guys yeah. can have that conversation oh geez right, yeah right. no I mean, and we've had it. We've had it before, you know, mm -hmm. and we'll have it again. So that's just yep. part of uh, part of having having to deal with Lovecraft is you got to deal with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And, so anyway, but, you know, there's other cats too besides this cat. Oh, yeah. there are. Yeah, there's Cracker, Honky, <laughs> Chinksy. Oh God, Miss Dago Shamrock Jutaco. <laughs> oh no. So, you know, Packy Bell. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah there's and seven there's cats all all of them have racist nine. names there's nine yeah there's nine cats uh but they're all racist yeah they're all they all have racist names <laughs> yeah so it's equal opportunity if you saw the original draft you'd know that but yeah. unfortunately only the one Drunk cat gets Nick. named right <laughs> Oh, gosh. So anyway, There's, on July 22nd. On July 22nd. Which is only just a few days after he's moved into his new house. Yeah. Yeah, he moved in like a week before. Yeah, that's it. And um, then and then this happens. Yeah, the cat starts flipping out, moving from room to room. Right, oh, sniffing yeah. Sniffing at the walls. 
And uh, I, Lovecraft writes here something I, I found interesting, this sentence. He says, I realize how trite this sounds. Like the inevitable dog in the ghost story which always growls before his master sees the sheeted figure. Yet I cannot consistently suppress it. And, uh, I don't know, I feel like he's talking right to us. Like, hey guys, <laughs> right. I know this is a little cliche, but this is what the cat was doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it kind of makes it, it makes it feel a little bit more real. Yeah. Uh, because he, because the character in the story is aware of all of the things that the reader would typically be aware of. Mm -hmm. And he's like, look, I know, you know, I know what you're thinking. I thought the same thing too, which makes it feel a little bit more legitimate. It, it's, it's like how when, when your Poe narrator is always saying, obviously this can't be going on. I'm just making it up. You know, this, right. I must have just sort of hallucinated the, how creepy the house looked or, mm. or how strange my friend's appearance was. It's like, I couldn't, he couldn't really have looked that strange. I'll just tell you what I thought I saw, but we both know that I'm completely rational. <laughs> <laughs> I possibly have seen that. Right. Absolutely. Um, well, and, I mean, the cat just doesn't start freaking out. And, you know, the, the, the tapestry on the wall is moving. You know, oh right. Well, that's the, that. Well, so the first night, the cat, uh, his cat is freaking out, and then and then that day, he, he asks, the, he he finds out that all the cats were freaking out, and that night when he goes, oh to right, bed, yes, and the, the next night, the next night though, uh huh, the cat starts acting the same way again, and this time he hears the rats, in yes, the walls, and he doesn't just hear them, yeah, he sees the tapestry moving. When he puts the tapestry aside, there's no rats there; it's just the stone wall. Yeah, yeah, and uh, nobody else heard anything, of course, in the house. No, either night. So um, he borrows some traps from Captain Norris, and, and he hits the sack again the next night. I retired early, being very sleepy, but was harassed by dreams of the most horrible sort. I seemed to be looking down from an immense height upon a twilight grotto, knee-deep with filth, where a white-bearded demon swineherd drove about with his staff a flock of fungus flabby beasts whose appearance filled me with unutterable loathing. Then, as the swineherd paused and nodded over his task, a mighty swarm of rats rained down on the stinking abyss and fell to devouring beasts and man alike. Yeah. Yeah, jeez. Uh, the His cat, Nigerman, wakes him up from this dream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And cat's uh, freaking out. The cat's uh, freaking out. And then the tapestry again is moving, and that's he's right. like afraid to turn on the light. He doesn't want to turn on the light, but he does it. And then he runs over and pulls it away. There you go. That's what And happened. yeah. And then there's nothing there, and he looks over at the trap, and the trap has been sprung, but yeah. it's empty. Which I'm like, why would you have rat traps around with all these cats? He's doubling up. Oh, okay. Sounds like a lot of rats. <laughs> Belt and suspenders. He's a practical American. Well, he opens the door to his bedroom and his cat goes flying out. And he hears that night all the rats are, are, are like descending in the house. Yeah, they're like crawling down the walls and going yeah. down into the basement or whatever. And, and all the servants are complaining that their cats are freaking too, but they can't hear the noises. Teleporting. Right, yeah. The, the, when he wakes up, all the servants come in because they're like, yeah, what the heck's going on? The cats are freaking out. What do you see? And then he can't go to sleep that night after right. that. Everybody kind of calms down. So he goes into the study mm -hmm. and he starts, you know, he starts, you know, reading and taking it easy. And then he hears the, the rats again and they're yeah. crawling down and deeper and deeper. And there seems like there's thousands of them. So the next day he, he gets on his cell phone and he calls Captain Norris. <laughs> And uh, says, "Come over here. You gotta, you gotta help me out with this." And he was a little nervous about telling him I'm hearing these rats, but the captain's—he's he's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, cool good people. he's good people. He's good people. And uh, they sort of explore the sub cellar where the cats have been leading him. The cats have been going down to the store and meowing right. down there. And they've been there before. They see all the remnants of Roman paganism. They talk about some altar-like stones that are down there, mm -hmm. and you know, one of them has some curious brown stains on it. Yeah, and, and then there's like been, some, yeah, there's been a burning. Like there's like a charred. So somebody kind yeah. of offered some sign of uh, sacrifices or something. Right, right. And they mentions uh, Addis? Addis. Addis, yeah. Addis, who I believed was the son of a Sibeli that he, he castrated himself. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty intense story. And these people mm -hmm. were worshipping this guy. Yes. And uh, Kybele as well. And Kybele as well. Yeah. So... What 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 possesses people to worship a guy that uh, castrates himself? Supposedly, they were a lot of um, eunuchs too. Like that, uh, being part of this cult, mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. you would want to become a eunuch? Well, sense. you might not want to, but I don't know if you want to. I don't know who willingly joins this cult. You know, there really doesn't seem to be an upside to it. Right. So he and Captain Norris come to a, a great solution, which is let's pull some couches down there. Uh, well, they have their servants drag the couches Right, yeah, down. they don't actually yeah. Have, yeah. Uh, And let's take a rest in the sub-cellar and... and um, we're going to find out what's up. We're going to find see, out what's up. We're going to see some rats. Of course, I'll probably fall asleep, but uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully... This also like lurking fear. But so they, they drag him down there, and our guy does drift off, and he has that dream about the swineherd and the fungus beasts again. Right. Um, 
when he wakes, the cats are all outside of the door. They shut the door. The cats are out there freaking out. Yeah. Now, he has his little black cat in there who's pacing around the chamber, and he, Delpore starts to hear the rats again. Right. This shouldn't be, though, because the you know these walls are limestone. They shouldn't be porous. Yeah, yeah, no way. Um, of course, Norris can't hear the rats, no. but he, he knows sees, the cats are reacting. The, yeah, he hears the cats freaking out, and it's freaking him out, and he can't hear it, but but our protagonist can, so he's it's really it's he's scared too. It's yeah. freaking him out. But the rats are going down, 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 much Deeper. further than they should yeah, be exactly. able to go, and uh, the cat starts scratching at the stone altar in the middle of the room. And when they look at what the cat is scratching at, they, they can't see anything, but they put the lantern down to get a closer look. Right. And the flame flickers from a draft of yeah, air. it does. Just coming from below the altar. Yeah, what do they do? What are they going to do? They're going to go back up to the well-lit study. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and have a conversation about this. Right. And uh, then they decide to go to London and collect experts. Experts. This, at this point, I really feel like this is right out of you know what the Call of Cthulhu role playing game is based out of. Like yeah. they go to London and they get experts. They get an archaeologist. They get a, 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 a psychic investigator. They get an anthropologist. Right. And all these people, you know, go with them back to the Priory. Yeah, they all jump on the train to Anchester. Anchester, and then and then. They investigate. Yeah. Now, I, I should mention that on that train ride, um, he mentions that everybody's somber because the president has just died. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's Warren Harding. Yep. Who uh, had a heart attack while he was in office. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and from what I know, just with my passing knowledge, was a terrible president. Yeah, I suppose he wasn't so great. Uh, that's, um, uh, in my opinion, that is overblown. Um, yeah. Harding oh, okay. was actually uh, pretty good. It's just that he managed to um, really, really piss off H.L. Mencken. And Mencken wrote one of the great takedowns in all American literature about how terrible a boob and an ignoramus Harding was. That has been more famous than anything Harding actually did. But if you look at you know, his actual record in office, he, you know, when he comes in, inflation is running at about 100%. Woodrow Wilson had had his stroke and basically left the government running on autopilot for six months. Harding fixes the economic mess. He cuts the budget deficit by a third. He creates the Office of Management and Budget. He creates the Bureau of Veterans Affairs. He negotiates the actual treaties that end World War I for America. You know, he's a pretty... He's got his problems, obviously. He's got the teapot dome and some scandals with right. his administration. But if you're looking at how is the country, after he's done with it, it's prosperous and at peace and doing well. <laughs> and when you look at what a, what a horrible mess it was you know, with a hundred thousand people thrown in jail because they disagreed with World War One or right. whatever else yeah. that uh, Wilson had been doing. You know, Harding comes off looking pretty good. Yeah, and I okay. think since uh, Wilson was a history professor, I think a lot of history professors don't like a president that makes Wilson look bad. Ah. So you know, I, and That's some good, uh, a good the perspective thing, there. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is in 1923, when Harding died, um, it was a huge body blow to Americans. I mean, uh, Lovecraft would have known that the, the body went from coast to coast on a funeral train and people poured out and they stood along the train tracks and they watched the body go by on the train. Yeah. And it was a, it was a real, it was a real blow. He, he'd won the largest single popular majority in the history of the president. He, his, his election in 1920 was a huge landslide victory. Yeah. And so he was very personally popular and there were, there were people who, who had their problems with him one way or the other. And people were upset obviously about the fact that, I forget if it was his um, uh, head of Veterans Affairs had fled to England, the head of prosecution, and the, his interior secretary was, was stealing oil from the government and whatever else. So that was a problem. But again, no one picked Harding per se as, as, as someone they, that they despised because of it. And he was on the verge of doing sort of a nationwide speaking tour, whistle-stop tour, to, to address the, the, the scandals in his cabinet uh, because his attorney general turned out to actually be a real crook. And um, so that, that's the moment that he that he dies, and it probably is because of all the all the cabinet all right. scandals that he has that heart attack. Well, now I, he also, you know, he he liked to cheat on his wife and and drink despite prohibition and play cards. The two among us doesn't like to drink despite prohibition and play cards. Exactly. It's true. Well, I, yeah. you know, Chad Chad said that because it's something personal. Uh, Harding actually hit on his great married great grandmother. Oh uh, well, yeah, and, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So he's you know, he, she had a fondness for tall men. <laughs> yeah. In walks Warren G. Hart. <laughs> and with that, we conclude part one of The Rats in the Walls with Kenneth Height. Next week, part two. This has been the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast at hppodcraft.com. hppodcraft.com. How?
thousands of rats. 